Every year, tens of thousands of dogs, mostly beagles, are used as tools in deadly research experiments. Join me, your host, Ellie Hansen, as we dive into this issue and talk to all the awesome people out there trying to make a difference for these dogs. Best of all, find out what you can do to help. We're opening doors for discussion and shedding light on the facts. This is Dog Research Exposed. The first time I ever watched research dogs taking their first steps of freedom outside a laboratory cage was a Beagle Freedom Project video. It was a video of the organization's very first rescue of two beagles who had never been outside before, never seen the sun or blue sky, never touched grass with their paws, and never known human kindness. I urge you to visit the Beagle Freedom Project website and watch it. Watch it because it's a happy ending and a reminder of why these sweet, gentle dogs need all of our voices. Beagle Freedom Project is a nonprofit advocacy organization and the world's leading organization for rescuing and rehoming dogs and other animals used in experimental research. Since 2010, the charity has been freeing survivors from laboratory experiments and striving to end this cruelty through its educational programs, campaign initiatives, and lobbying efforts. I first met Shannon Keith, president of the Beagle Freedom Project, over a Zoom call in the summer of 2020. I was interviewing her for my book, Laboratory Dogs Rescued. I was struck by the fact that behind this soft-spoken, very kind person was an enormous strength, a palpable energy, so to speak, that was deeply connected to the cause of protecting animals from cruelty, especially the practice of abusing animals for scientific research. Two years later, when we spoke again for this podcast, that strength is still there, maybe even stronger. And I'm excited to share our in-depth conversation with you in this episode. You are a high-profile, formidable force in the fight against animal testing and rescuing dogs and other animals from research laboratories. Can you bring us back to that first moment when you decided to start Beagle Freedom Project? Wow. Thank you. Yes. Um, (laughs) It was uh, definitely one of the greatest moments of my life and something that I'll never forget because um, it was one of those moments that you look back on and say, wow, um, that changed my entire life. You know, obviously my entire life has been built around saving animals and I feel that that's really why I'm here. That's the reason uh, for my very existence. Um, But um, yeah, I I received a a phone call and I was told about these beagles in the laboratory who um, needed to get out. And it was sort of a chain of events, like a call um, from a person and a person and a person, and it kind of trickled down to me. And... Uh, vivisection has always been one of those issues that touched me the most. Of course, all forms of animal cruelty bother me, but uh, for some reason, animal testing has been the one where um, has been like my my deepest fight. And I could not believe that there were these beagles in a laboratory who had the chance to get out, and that. Of all the people on this chain, nobody was able to get them out or could get them out. And so I uh, jumped at the chance, of course. And so um, that phone call was just sort of a dream come true. That was December 20th, 2010. And the rescue happened on December 23rd, 2010. And that completely changed everything and spawned Beagle Freedom Project. What was your reaction to meeting the dogs for the first time? Because I can imagine that that would have been super emotional. I mean, for me, 
whenever I see the dogs have freedom for the first time in online videos, I almost cry. And just to fathom the fact that they've never been outside a cage before, it's just super emotional for me to think about. Yeah, so that was incredibly emotional. It was overwhelming. And I'm so glad that I just grabbed my little tiny camera. I mean, back then that was before like iPhones and stuff. And so I just happened to bring it. I wasn't even thinking about filming it. And so anyone can watch it now on YouTube. It's our very first rescue. And, you know, I fantasized about it. You know, I played it over and over in my head as uh, my friends and I were going up there to get these dogs. I thought, okay, they're going to be so scared. You know, they've been living in a, a laboratory their entire lives and they've been tested on. They've never been outside. And so in my head, I envisioned I'm going to open up the crate and they're just going to run. They're going to be so excited. They're just going to be running and doing zoomies and it's going to be the best day of their lives. Um, and it was just the very opposite that happened. So we met the person from the laboratory at her house, actually, because um, it was in Northern California. We flew up there and then we rented a car to drive back home. And uh, we met her at her home and the, there were two beagles. They were both in crates in the back of her car and they were shaking uncontrollably. They were salivating. They had already defecated in their crates and we wanted to let them out in her yard first before we drove home. So we brought the crates into her backyard and um, we opened up the crate doors and they just stood there shaking uncontrollably and would not exit the crates because that is all they ever knew. They were squinting. They had never been outdoors. She worked at the lab and she told us, she said, they're not going to know how to walk. These are dogs who are over two years old. And I was like, what do you mean they're not going to know how to walk? She said, well, I mean, they've never been outside. And I mean, these are things that I I thought I already knew. I had been doing this my whole life. Like, what do you mean they're not going to know how to walk? Are you serious? Um, and, you know, I edited the video, obviously, but um, it took about 20 minutes for that first dog to finally take his first step out of that first crate. And um, when he finally did, I mean, we were all crying. And then he walked over to the other beagle and touched his nose. And then that other beagle, then he finally took his step out because he then, you know, had the bravery to step out of his crate. But it was unbelievable, those, those first few moments where they were just too scared to enter the outside world. One of the most frequent questions I personally get when I'm talking to people about dog research and beagles is why beagles? I've had beagles in my personal life for 17 years. And so to me, they're the sweetest, goofiest, kindest dog I've ever owned. And I've owned other breeds and I love all my dogs, you know, but beagles are just extra sweet and extra gentle. So I was hoping, since maybe not everybody understands why we're using beagles in research, I was hoping you could explain that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and a lot of that also came from our from that first rescue, uh, where she was just talking, this one from the lab, and she said, um, you know, they use them because they're so docile and they're so forgiving. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, they're just look at them. They just let you do whatever you want to them. I came to learn that that was very true. And so, uh, beagles have the best nature. Like you said, they're so sweet. And so they are exploited for the very reason that they have such a great temperament and such a great nature. They will not fight back. They're not going to bite you. Um, of, you know, the thousands of beagles we've rescued, you know, when you pick them up, they go limp. In your arms because that is what they're used to doing they all we've been told they're also the perfect size for cages for feeding unfortunately all of these reasons is the reasons that they're used for testing and what kinds of tests are these dogs being used for i don't want to get too graphic but 
I also believe listeners have a right to know and to understand the realities of what's going on in those laboratories for these dogs right now. Yeah, they do. And I'm glad that you asked that question because people still don't know. Um, I call it the industry's dirty secret. Um, you know, the animal testing industry has billions of dollars and they have great ways of hiding the truth from people. And we're here to expose that. And it's difficult because <clears throat> no matter how much we, we try to expose it, they have the money and the means to, to hide it. And so, you know, you can walk into any mall today and go up to um, L'Oreal counter and ask um, the woman behind the counter, like, do you test on animals? And she, she'll say no, because she honestly believes like, no, we don't test on animals. Your company, the company you're working for tests on animals um, because people believe that animal testing ended in the 90s or that quote unquote, oh, we only test sometimes on rabbits or rats, even though that's wrong as well, right? Um, it, it's a widely held belief that dogs and cats uh, aren't tested on. That is absolutely not true. And so to answer your question, beagles and other breeds of dogs are tested on for a, a larger variety of things. They are tested on for pharmaceuticals, for medical devices, uh, for sometimes for cosmetics uh, and for a lot of other really hideous psychological experimentation as well and just scientific curiosities which are beyond disgusting like the one we just revealed at Invigo. You know your typical kind of toxicology testing is really um, very common with with beagles Basically, any kind of a drug that you take is going to be tested on dogs. And the reality for these dogs is that, that that's all they know, that it's an unpleasant experience and painful. So just speaking honestly, if you're going to dose dogs with drugs at different doses, sometimes really high doses, I mean, that's just got to make them so sick. I struggle with that all the time thinking, oh my God. These dogs are feeling sick all the time because how could they not? Right, and that's the point, is to make them feel sick because that's how they test the drug. And what people also don't know is that they do the dosing through something called oral gavage, and that's where they take a tube that looks like, um, that looks like a hose, and uh, they shove it down their throats, you know, and like down their esophagus. And um, that's something that they typically do without anesthesia, uh, without pain medication. They'll do it while, you know, the dogs are fully conscious in pain, screaming. You can imagine what that feels like if that were being done to you, um, how painful and uncomfortable that would be. And so they do that. The point is to make them sick, to make them vomit, to make them pass out, to see how long it takes for them to either um, get violently ill or die. Um, you know, a lot of these tests are done uh, by companies that are called CROs, they're contract research organizations. So they're private laboratories. They're hired by these big organizations um, to do specific tests for, for a specific amount of time. And a lot of them, their protocol is to kill them afterwards, whether or not they are healthy. And that's the really sad part about all of this too. And that's the other thing that people don't realize is that they can be perfectly healthy dogs, but the protocol is to kill them because they don't want their trade secrets out there. Somehow their secret is gonna get out about um, what we did to them and they're gonna find out about a certain drug or something like that. Or they're gonna see certain injuries on a dog and know what was done to them somehow. Um, and that's the reason why they don't want these animals released. The industry doesn't want the Beagle Freedom Bill, that, that's why the industry hates Beagle Freedom Project. They hate us. They don't want to release dogs to us at all. They want to release them and dump them at the shelter. They want to release them anywhere else. I mean, they don't want to release them, period, but if they're going to do it, they're going to be forced to do it because of our Beagle Freedom Bill. They want them to go to places that know nothing about what was done to them. They want them to just be dumped somewhere. They hate us and they don't want people to know that anything was done to them. So to me, that's a huge challenge, just trying to get dogs out of laboratories. It's a huge challenge, but it always has been, but it's, it, 
became bigger once we started our legislation, uh, which I always knew it would be. So my point was never to always be able to rescue animals from laboratories because it was never to always put a Band-Aid on the situation. It was to end animal testing. So what I thought from the very beginning was, okay, we're going to be able to rescue animals for about a couple of years. We're going to raise all of this awareness. These animals will be our ambassadors for change. This is how people are going to learn that dogs and cats, like the ones who are family members, are being tested on. Then people are going to care. Then we're going to start changing laws. Then we're never going to get animals again because the industry's never, they're not, they're not going to trust us. They're going to hate us, uh, which is essentially what happened. However, we're still able to get animals out of laboratories. We're just able to get them out in a different way. It's totally legal. It's just different. And now we have all these other um, like copycat organizations, which it's great. They're doing what we're doing and they're able to get them out and they're not political like we are. So good on you. And we're going a different route and we're changing laws and, and doing what we initially wanted to do. So it's fine. I don't mind us not getting out as many animals as we used to, but um, we actually still are. <laughs> but it, I, it's going to slow down. I get that. So you're kind of coming at it from a different angle. Since we're talking about politics and the Beagle Freedom Bill, can you share a bit about what's going on right now with your advocacy work, since that's where your focus has really gone? And I think that's personally super important because law, laws changing is when this whole thing is going to change. Exactly, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that obviously rescue is wonderful and amazing for all of those individual lives. Um, and I would never take that away. And that's been essential and wonderful for us for the past 11 plus years. But that just can't keep going on. It, we've got to end this. And it's difficult to do both because... You can't work sort of with a laboratory or with laboratories and also work to end animal testing. Those two do not go hand in hand uh, because once you work to end animal testing, the laboratories won't work with you to release the animals, period. It's just those two don't go together. Our advocacy is really um, taking you know, front and center stage now moving forward, and which is why we started Open Cages Naming Names this year, which is um, our big step towards completely, you know, being in your face, releasing all the evidence that we've collected over the last 11 years against all these facilities to um, really go after them, completely shut it all down. I believe that we have enough evidence now to let the government know this needs to end, it needs to end now. And um, I mean, it's of course an uphill battle, but we have a lot. And I'm excited to release it step by step. Of course, this cannot happen overnight, as we've seen. But we're poised right now where enough people care. It's in the media now. It's been out there um, for like almost a year where people on all sides of the political party, you know, like they care about it. And they're mad. I get calls from politicians, Republicans, Democrats everyone and they want to do something and we're ready the world is ready now for your open cages naming names campaign one of the first companies that you shine a light on is envigo and that undercover footage of beagle puppies and mothers suffering inside filthy cages and other horrifying footage of severe animal neglect was all over social media and it put it into the public eye and that wasn't the only undercover video that's recently surfaced on social media. So I feel like there's a ton of pressure now on these companies because it's all coming to light. The darkness that's been hidden for so long, thank God, is coming to light. Can you talk a little bit about Envigo right now? What can you publicly say about what's happening with them? <laughs> Envigo needs to close. I don't know why Envigo has not been closed by, by the USDA or its license completely revoked. Yeah. So I'm so excited about all the evidence out there 
I'm so grateful to the other organizations who have, you know, gone undercover, put the information out there. You know, we wanted to focus on, you know, one of the specifically hideous protocols that they've done to um, the nursing mothers, the other things they've done, defrauding the public. You know, Invigo is, is of course, one of many and owned by Initiative and has these different facilities where they don't just breed, but they test and they do horrific testing there. It There is absolutely no excuse for these facilities to still be in business when the USDA has done inspection after inspection, found horrific violations of the Animal Welfare Act that go just beyond anything that is, I, I mean, it, these are grossly unacceptable violations. These are hideous. They've given them days to correct. They've come back and they've not only found the same violations, but they've found even worse violations. This place not only should have been shut down, licensed, permanently revoked, but these people actually should have been put in jail for animal felony abuses. The fact that nothing has been done is disgusting. It's an embarrassment. It's, I'm embarrassed. Since we're talking about this, and I forget what year it was in, but there was a facility that reminded me a lot of Invigo called Green Hill in Italy. And they had similar animal welfare violations where so many puppies, actually thousands of puppies, were dying every year inside this research breeding facility. And they actually shut that place down and they got all 3,000 beagles adopted. It was a huge rescue operation, but this reminds me of that. Wouldn't that be awesome if that could happen here? It would be amazing. It would. Um, you know, unfortunately, the laws um, are so different in different countries, right? Like in Italy, in Italy it was so cool if you had um, the... The laws with activists um, sort of storming uh, the place and, and taking the dogs, um, the consequences for those actions were not as severe as they would be here in the United States. So you have that. <laughs> um, but damn, it would be super cool. Yeah. <laughs> I've always wondered, what's a typical day like for Shannon Keith? Because you're one of my heroes. And because I share this issue with you deeply in my heart, you know, I do my thing, but you're out there on the front lines. How do you balance the political advocacy projects and rescuing dogs and have a life? It depends. You know, we have a, we have a great office um, here in Los Angeles, California, uh, where I go to several days of the week. And so sometimes I'm at the office, sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm in the field, sometimes I'm working from home. It just depends. I definitely work a lot on legislation and what bills I want to be bringing up and working on with different people in different states. I try to keep us as relevant as possible all over um, the media to make sure that you know people are talking about animal testing and talking about our app because our app cruelty cutter is a great way for people to shop cruelty free and that opens the door for people to do more research on their own and what i've learned is that when people do that then they learn because they sort of do it on their own they stick with it you know and they don't feel like it's been pushed on them right and they love it working with different facilities which i still do we still have a great relationship with several animal testing facilities, people who work there who contact us for updates, who contact us with animals to be released. So there are a few across the United States who have dogs, rabbits, some farm animals, and you know we work with them on when they can be released, how they can be released, how we'll negotiate that and do that. I still reach out to some who have released to us in the past to try to just say, hey, we're here, you know, don't forget about us. Um, if you don't want to work with us, there's someone else you can work with. We do a lot of rescues with 
uh, South Korea. Um, we have a partner there with beagles who are in laboratories. There's a great network, network called Beagle Rescue out there, and they do tons of rescues from laboratories in South Korea. And then working with, with my crew, you know, with my amazing, amazing crew at BFP, having meetings with them and working with them on our campaigns. This kind of ties into your work. I know that I'm personally deeply affected by being surrounded by this topic of dogs suffering in laboratories. It's something I think about every day. You've been closer to this issue than most people every day for 12 years. So how do you cope and not let this overwhelm you? I know that I am not the only one that feels this way. You know, people are crushed when they see these videos on social media. They feel helpless and hopeless and angry and they feel hatred and they feel every feeling that you can feel. And those feelings take an emotional toll. So how do you keep going? You know, some days are harder than others. Channeling my energy into this work, actually, I know it kind of doesn't make sense because the work is what is difficult. However, channeling it into the work, into the fight, is what helps me. So those days that are particularly difficult where, for example, I'll give you a good example. A few weeks ago, I got a message from someone who I've worked with in the past. She sent me a horrible video of these beagles in a laboratory where she was, and it was so sad. And she said, can you help me? I, I have to get them out. I said, yes, of course. And we're working on that right now. But that video was so disturbing. You know, it was just so disturbing. I wanted to just bust in right then and there, right? But of course you can't do that. I needed a minute, like, okay. Whew. Then just my brain switches to fight mode. Okay, well, we've got Beagle Freedom Project. We've got the resources, we've got the people, we've got people like you, we've got our volunteers, our supporters. We know what to do. We're gonna get them out. We're gonna put it out there. We got everybody who cares and we're gonna fight for them. And I just put it all into that. And you know, my, it's like my adrenaline gets going and my anger builds up and um, I'm just ready to go. Let's put out a press release. Let's get an e-blast going. Let's like just put all of our resources into this and get creative. You know, how creative can we get about this? Like. What can we do about it? I don't know. Call me crazy, but that's like, that's how I deal with it. I mean, obviously like there's, I need a work-life balance more. You know, when I get upset and see things like that, I'm like, okay, we're going to fight for this. So instead of like sitting and crying, I get like through it by, by fighting for it because I know we can do something about it. I like react by going, yeah, we're going to fight for this and we can do something about it. Okay. Switching gears a little bit. If somebody wants to foster or adopt a beagle from Beagle Freedom Project, how would they go about doing that? What's the process between rescuing a dog from a research facility and then someone picking up their dog? This is the fun part. <laughs> so, um, so of course we don't always know, you know, when we're going to get dogs, when we're going to be rescuing dogs. And so, you know, we get that question a lot, like, when am I going to have contacted? Like, how do I know? Are all your dogs on your website? No, they're not. Uh, because a lot of them are confidential. And also we don't know when we're going to get our next one. So we always say, if you're interested in fostering or adopting, just please fill out an application now. So you're in our program. So go to our website, bfp.org slash rescue or adopt and fill out the form. So you're in our system. And then when we have a rescue in your area, then that's when we go to your application and we read it and check it out and we'll contact you. That's like the first step. You probably, well, you won't get to meet your, your beagle or your dog ahead of time. It's just how it works. These are dogs who are just special needs. We don't meet them ahead of time. <laughs> Typically, let's say we have a, a rescue at a laboratory in San Diego. They come 
to our home office and you come there and witness their first steps of freedom. Uh, you're there with the other fosters who have been chosen. You're chosen because you're somebody who is very open-minded. You believe in our cause passionately. You are already cruelty-free or you are willing to learn and have a cruelty-free home. And that means no products tested on animals because that would not make sense. You are okay with a dog who does not know the difference between right and wrong, who does not understand the English language, who is going to pee and poo all over. All of these things that, you know, you're going to have to teach this dog. And a dog who really is not going to be making eye contact. We call it the Beagle Breakthrough. It's going to take maybe a few weeks, some with the younger ones, maybe just a few days. But they're so scared and they don't understand connection because they made sure they didn't make that connection in the laboratory. But then one day when they make it, it is the most amazing feeling in the world. And every foster we've had has said like, that is like the greatest feeling they've ever had when that dog makes that connection and they breathe that sigh of relief and they know that there's trust there and love finally. They have made that, that bond. So it's getting to that point. I've witnessed that myself with my own laboratory research rescues and it is the most special moment. Life is full of special moments, but that is extra special. And I can't really explain exactly why. Maybe you can explain why. Because I've spoken with many people who have adopted laboratory research dogs, and these people, their entire lives actually, change for the better. And when they talk about their research dog, their eyes light up, they start to smile, and they're so proud. And it's like you could just feel the energy of love pouring off of them, all because of this dog. What is that exactly? You're so right. The way you describe it is so on point. I don't know. It is literally this intangible thing. Um, we have a private group on Facebook now for all of our fosters and adopters. That's like over a thousand people. And I mean, you can't go through it fast enough because you'll miss like a post because it's just everyone gushing about their babies. And I mean, we've formed so many families and best friends and people fly to each other's houses for reunions and it's just love, so much love and happiness and lives changed. I don't know. All I can think of is it's like these dogs have gone through the worst kind of trauma one can imagine or can't even imagine, right? Like just... I don't know. I mean, I'm Jewish and, um, you know, I have family from the Holocaust with the tattooed numbers on their arm. And when I look at the tattoos and the ears, like that's what I think about for me I, and hearing stories from the Holocaust and concentration camps for me, that's sort of what I think about. And I think about like being a survivor, if they could talk, having that love and having that trust. I always say we have so much to learn from them because I know as humans, there isn't that trust, but the dogs do show that trust and that love. And I think that's what makes that so special. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your new film, Sanctuary. In this case, your film is about primates who are living an unnatural life in captivity, in homes or in cages or in laboratories. What inspired you to make this film? You know, um, I was thinking about the concept of Sanctuary. Obviously, sanctuaries are 
one of those things that are required, but I, I feel sometimes, um, how do I say this? Uh, they are like uh, used incorrectly. So I wanted to explore the issue of sanctuary, right? What is, what is a sanctuary? Like what, and what is sanctuary? And I thought that it would be great to be able to tell the stories of some primates who, who live in sanctuary and weave together the different sort of issues and, and struggles. And of course, you know, exploitive ways, unfortunately, society treats animals through, you know, vivisection, the exotic pet trade through these stories and really, you know, educate the public about those different sanctuaries and have that be something people really think about and then learn as well. And I don't know that there's an answer, you know, because obviously with, with these animals, there's really no place else to go but sanctuary. But, you know, I just, I thought it was a neat thing to explore and something to look at and something to learn about. And these primates were just amazing. I had the best time uh, traveling and, and filming uh, these, these sweet, sweet souls who I just absolutely fell in love with. It was an amazing experience. It was a really wonderful film, honestly. I highly recommend anyone to watch it. And there's a part in the film that includes footage of a primate research laboratory and a gentleman who used to work in that laboratory. And that, of course, struck me pretty strongly. One thing he said is, I can't tell you the name of the facility where I worked because my safety would be jeopardized. And so that kind of brought it all back to this undercover world that we're dealing with when we talk about research laboratories. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, um, I've gotten several letters and emails from whistleblowers who have a lot to say. This is some of the evidence that we will be exposing this year um, from people who are literally scared to death who are so scared that it has taken them, some of them decades to come forward, but still will not reveal where they worked or their names, but have it a lot to say, a lot of hideous things. To say. I mean, the things they say that went on in these places is, I mean, you'll vomit. It's horrible. And that's why I am so thankful that we're talking today because you know, my personal goal is to bring these topics to the light. I believe that in the light is where this will finally end. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And thank you so much for that. It has to be out there. People need to hear it. They need to, they need to know, like you said, they need to know the truth. No matter how hard it is to hear, that's the only, that's the only way we're going to change anything is for people to hear it and um, to spread that message, you hear it, tell somebody else, please. You know, continue that. People need to know. And also that we all have a voice. You know, every person that signs a petition or makes a phone call or talks to their representative in the government, it just doesn't take a lot of time, but every voice matters, in my opinion. Agreed, 100%. One person can make a huge difference. You may have heard Shannon and I talking about a research dog breeding facility called Envigo. In case you don't know, Envigo is a massive breeding facility that supplies dogs to universities, major drug makers, and the National Institutes of Health for experimentation. It is a factory farm operation located in Virginia that recently came into question after an undercover investigation by PETA showed over 5,000 dogs living in horrific conditions. The U.S. Department of Agriculture did several inspections and cited in Vigo with 70 serious violations of the Animal Welfare Act, which they never attempted to fix. 
Please stay tuned for more action steps you can take to help get all the beagles out of Invigo for good at www.bfp.org. Thanks for listening to Dog Research Exposed. Check out our website at www.dogresearchexposed.com for more resources and actions you can take to help dogs in research laboratories today.